So first I'd like to thank IPing and the Institute for inviting me to come and talk to you today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some of the work that we do in my lab in terms of energy storage. But in um, overall, what we work on in my lab is looking at a surface electrolyte interface in order to uh, either store charge, which is what you're going to hear about today in a supercapacitive way, or we also use it to look at biosensors. So we use uh, capacitance at a surface to quantify biologically relevant molecules as well. And so what um, you're going to see today is, a, is our energy storage work. And we're looking at supercapacitors. Um, and because supercapacitors are relatively new and we often don't actually know very much about supercapacitors, I'm going to give you just a very brief introduction to, uh, to this, these systems. Now, supercapacitors, uh, most of us probably would swear that we don't own one, but in fact, many of us do. Um, and that's because they're in systems, but they are in systems where we, we actually don't know that they, they are used. So one of the first applications was actually in car audio systems. In car audio systems, as they became more powerful and as we tended to play our music more loudly, what people were finding was that every time there was a, a large bass beat, the lights on their car would dim. And so they needed something to provide the high power because the, the bass beat is a very high power situation. And so supercapacitors fit perfectly in this uh, application because supercapacitors are high power, uh, high power supply. They can provide high powers, but also they can be charged and discharged millions of times without ever needing replacement. And so we could imagine if you want to uh, support music where you have a lot of bass beats, you want something that's not going to fail after three or 4,000 cycles. And so supercapacitors fit that perfectly. And the fact that they can be charged millions of times before they fail is one of the reasons we don't know that we own supercapacitors because they go into the applications and then we never replace them. And so we don't actually have to take them out and replace them as we would a battery. Supercapacitors are also in some fleet vehicles, uh, replacing the lead acid batteries. And this is particularly important in uh, places where the fleet vehicles are required to turn their engine off every time they stop. So you can imagine for uh, garbage trucks or uh, mail delivery trucks, they need to tar start their vehicle many times a day. And with the lead acid battery, what they were finding is that those lead acid batteries were failing really rapidly and they were needing to be replaced. Supercapacitors can uh, provide the power needed to start the vehicle and they don't need to be replaced. And so they are going into these fleet vehicles. This is actually a fleet uh, from Russia. Elit is one of the supercapacitor companies uh, in the world and they supply the, the uh, power to start the fleet vehicles. Similarly, because they have these long cycle lives, they go into remote locations or locations where it's not very easy to change uh, the energy storage system. So they go into uh, systems where they might be in the bottom of the ocean or they might be in remote like locations or uh, these are uh, sh street lighting, so uh, lights that go into the street itself. They're solar powered, so they need to be charged and discharged every day. And of course, they're in a position where it's difficult to change the energy storage system. So supercapacitors work beautifully in there. And the last application, <coughs> sorry, that I'm going to talk about is sort of an emerging application. This is with our, uh, our power tools. And if you're like me, you don't use your power tool that often. So when you take it out, and if it's a lithium ion uh, battery powered, power tool, I take it out and then I have to wait two to three hours to charge the battery before I can ever use it. But we can now have supercapacitors and they're again high power, which also means they charge very, very rapidly. So we're now starting to see uh, electric tools that are emerging into the market where they will discharge very rapidly, but they only require 90 seconds to charge. And for somebody like me, I can wait 90 seconds to do that. Now, as I'm talking, I'm comparing these to batteries, and I'm comparing them to batteries because that's really what we're, uh, we're familiar with. But what I want to highlight is that supercapacitors and batteries are not uh, technologies that will compete. These are going to be technologies that are complementary, and fuel cells are the same thing. What we're going to see, or what I predict we're going to see in the future, is not one technology that wins, but rather each technology will have its own niche. And supercapacitors are going to be the ones that will 
supply the high power. So in an electric vehicle, they will be the things that allow us to drive quickly. The batteries, the fuel cells will be the things that allow us to drive long distances. So we're not competing with batteries here. We're doing a complementary technique or uh, system. So let's talk a little bit about how they store charge. We're going to see two different types of uh, charge storage. The first one that I'm going to talk about is called double layer charge storage. And what we do is we have an electrode surface. There's, uh, we place charge on that electrode. That electrode is inside an electrolyte. And the ions from the electrolyte come and balance that charge just outside the surface. And so what we have is a layer of positive charge or a layer of negative charge on the surface and a layer of charge of the opposite sign in solution. And this is historically the reason we call this a double layer. There's two layers of charge. In reality, this is a much more complex uh, charge storage system. We don't have two layers. We actually have multiple layers. And a lot of research goes into figuring out exactly what this uh, charge storage looks like on this surface. But we're going to model it using a parallel plate capacitor because we can sort of imagine that we have a layer of charge on the surface, a layer of charge in solution, and that looks very similar to something we hopefully saw in first year physics, where we had two parallel plates of metal. We put charge of one, si uh, one sign on one plate and the opposite charge on the other, and we called that a, a capacitor. And so what that allows us to do is use the capacitance equation for a parallel plate capacitor to look at one of the characteristics that makes supercapacitors special um, and store uh, more charge than a uh, typical capacitor. And that's this uh, value A right here. So A is our surface area. And so what we do in a supercapacitor system is instead of using two parallel plates, we're going to replace it with that electrode electrolyte boundary. And now we're going to make that boundary a huge surface area. So instead of using a planar electrode, we're going to use a very high surface area electrode. And that allows us to store a lot more charge. So what we're talking about here is for a supercapacitor, we have farads of uh, ca capacitance per centimeter squared, as opposed to microfarads for uh, up conventional capacitors. And that's the, the history of the name supercapacitors. We just have a higher capacitance. We also have a second type of charge storage called pseudocapacitance. And as the name implies, this is a capacitance that isn't double layer. It's sort of a fake or pseudo uh, capacitance. And the way we uh, talk about this is an electrochemical reaction. So uh, something is being oxidized and reduced. But it has the electrochemical signature of a capacitor. And so what I have here is uh, what we would see if we were to run a CV, a cyclical tamogram of a conventional capacitor. So this is where we are applying a potential and measuring a current. Here I've changed it to, to differential capacitance. But what, for, what we would see for a conventional capacitor is a rectangle. And what we will be looking for for pseudocapacitance is something that appears uh, very similar. So the CV that I have here uh, for this uh, material, this is a carbon cloth material, the pseudocapacitance is actually these peaks right here. This is a Faradaic reaction. We're going to talk about what that reaction is. When I say Faradaic reaction, I'm saying something is being oxidized and something is being reduced. And this Faradaic reaction has a very similar electrochemical characteristic to a capacitor. Now, it's not a rectangle, and it doesn't need to be a rectangle. But what it needs to have are the characteristics where it's a mirror image above and below the zero current line. So if we take a zero current line across here, we can flip that upside down and we will draw the current off at the same potential uh, at which we place that current on. And that is what we call a pseudocapacitive reaction. And we will talk about this again later. Now, supercapacitors or electrochemical capacitors, they are great, and I love them, as is obvious by me dedicating my life to them. But to be honest, every system has its drawbacks. And one of the biggest drawbacks of supercapacitors is that they don't hold their charge very long. And so what happens is if you wanted to have a supercapacitor in your vehicle to replace the lead acid battery, you would charge that system up. Let's say you drove to the airport and went on vacation for seven days. By the time you come back to the parkade, that supercapacitor has lost all of its charge and is no longer able to start your vehicle. And the, the uh, issue is what we call self-discharge. 
So you charge up your supercapacitor, you leave it in a stored, uh, in a charged state, and over time it loses uh, potential. And we see that here. So this is a supercapacitor electrode. We've charged it to approximately one volt, and we see that it loses a significant amount of its potential in only 17 hours. And so this is a real problem. And what we want to do is figure out what's happening here. Can we figure out why it's losing charge? If we can figure out why it's losing charge, can we stop it from losing charge and then make the supercapacitors more applicable in, in more situations? So what we believe is happening are two different processes. One, we think uh, is a very rapid, or we thought it was a very rapid, charge redistribution. This, so this is where we put charge on the surface and we open the circuit and that charge moves through the electrode. And I'm going to describe that in our research into that. We also believe that there is a Faraday reaction happening on the surface. So the reaction of something in the cell, which is stealing charge essentially from the electrode surface. And I'm going to talk about our research into that as well. Before I talk about our particular research, I want to highlight some of the models that we use to help guide us in this work. And the models are, were proposed by Conway, as I Ping mentioned, he's the godfather of supercapacitors. And he proposed three models that are based on three possible rate determining steps for the Faradaic reaction. And by proposing these three rate determining steps, he could say, what would the self-discharge profile look like if this particular rate determining step is occurring? And so the first uh, process that he modeled was an activation controlled Faraday process. What this means is that your reactant is at a high enough concentration that we don't have to wait for diffusion. So this might be something like electrolyte decomposition, very high concentration. We don't have to wait for our species to diffuse to the surface. Alternately, it could be something that's attached to the surface. So again, we don't have to wait for diffusion, or it could be the reaction of the surface itself. And so any of those possible uh, situations would result in an activation controlled Faraday process. And we can identify an activation controlled Faraday process by plotting the self-discharge profile as a function of log time. And when we do that, what we will expect to see if it's activation controlled is a plateau and then a linear drop in potential. And so we plot our self-discharge profiles versus log time and look to see if it appears to be activation control. We also want to look for diffusion controlled reactions. So this is where you might have a reaction of something that's at low concentration or uh, an impurity in your cell. And what he modeled was that if you plot potential as a function of square root time, if it's a linear drop, it's a diffusion controlled process. He also mo uh, modeled the short circuit between the anode and the cathode. We never actually look at this possible model because as I'm going to show you, we use three electrode setups. or we're only looking at one supercapacitor electrode at a time. So we would never have a short circuit between our anode and cathode. So let's just quickly go through the experimental. Uh, these are the experimental con uh, conditions we use. We use one more sulfuric acid. We use that because we have a high conductivity in these solutions. Room temperature, we de aerate with nitrogen. And the cell that we use is a three compartment glass cell, which I'll show you a picture of. The, when we do cyclical tonometry, we use a sweep rate of one millivolt per second. And for those people who uh, understand cyclic voltammetry, this is a very, very slow sweep rate. And I told you that supercapacitors are high power. We should be able to run them very quickly. For the carbon that we're using that I'm going to describe to you, this is the highest sweep rate we can use. And I'll tell you why uh, when we get there. For a self-discharge experiment, we ramp the potential at one millivolt per second. We sometimes add a hold time, uh, usually 30 minutes. And then we open the circle, and we just measure the potential over time. So this is the cell that we use. It's a three compartment cell. We have a reference electrode, which is the SHE. We have a big counter electrode, which is a very, very large piece of a high surface area carbon electrode. And then our working electrodes are in a separate compartment. And that prevents contamination between any of the electrodes. And as I mentioned, we are going to test each supercapacitor electrode separately. So we test the positive electrode, and then separately we test the negative electrode. And these are, uh, this is the uh, working electrode setup that we use. We have a piece of carbon, and I'll talk about that carbon on the next slide. We have a current collector and a swage rock system that just holds everything together. Now the carbon we use, it's key that it has a very high surface area because, as I already talked about, a high surface area gives us a higher capacitance, means we're storing more charge. 
And so there's lots of options. We could use carbon nanotubes, powders, papers, and cloth. In my lab, we focus mainly on powders and the cloth. The cloth is what you're going to see today. We have tested uh, carbon papers as well. So let's talk specifically about the carbon that I'm going to show you today. So it's a carbon cloth material. You see an SEM image on the top right. The one most important characteristic of this carbon material is, is a very, very high surface area, again, giving us that high capacitance. And that's because we have these uh, fibers, they're woven together. We have pores on the fibers, and this is uh, a result of a BET measurement. And these are the pores that contribute most of the volume in, are actually in the 10 to 20 angstrom uh, size. So we're talking about very small pores, very high surface areas. The manufacturer uh, surface area, BT surface area is 2,500 meters squared per gram. In our hands, when we do DFT calculations, we get about 2,100 meters squared per gram. Nevertheless, very high surface areas. So that'll give us high capacitance. The other reason that we use this carbon is because it is a cl carbon cloth. So literally what we can do is punch that carbon out and use it directly. And this is really important for our work because adding binder to a carbon, like you would need to do for powder, can significantly, uh, significantly affect your self-discharge. First of all, the binder covers the surface. It can actually react with the carbon and make uh, new surface functionalities on the carbon, and people believe that it can actually enhance your self-discharge. So for this work, we look only at the carbon itself. And the final reason that we love this carbon, we use this carbon all the time, is because we have some surface functionalities that we can make on the carbon, which will allow us to store charge. So we've seen this CV already, but let me now explain what we see here. If you take your carbon, put it in sulfuric acid, and you run the CV, this red one is the first one you will see. And you see that in this region, there's, not, there's no charge storage. There's none of that pseudo capacitance. But as we take this carbon and we cycle it in sulfuric acid for about 350 cycles, which takes about a week to do, we can develop these quinone peaks. So this is the quinone hydroquinone uh, reaction. This is a pseudocapacitive reaction. It stores more charge for us. The other thing that we, uh, uh, reason we use this is because we believe that sur these surface functionalities actually cause self-discharge. So we wanted a carbon where we had a very clear electrochemical signal signature for the surface functionalities. And we see that with this carbon, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So we now uh, have seen the carbon. What we want to find out is if I plot, if I take a self-discharge profile and I plot it versus those two Conway models that I'm going to use, will it appear as activation controlled? suggesting possibly electrolyte decomposition, or will it appear as a uh, diffusion control, possibly suggesting maybe an iron shuttle uh, reaction. So the very first thing we did was plot this versus those two models, and we see very clearly a plateau and a linear drop in potential, which suggests an activation control process. Or I should say, in reality, at this point, it is suggested an activation control process. But what I'm about to show you is that this is not diagnostic for this process. But it is definitely not a diffusion control. And so what that immediately tells us is that whatever the reaction is, it's not an impurity in our cell. It's something else that's happening here. So as we were doing this, I said that that, that plateau and linear drop as we plot versus log time is not diagnostic for activation control. And that's something that we found when we did our research um, actually completely accidentally. When we were doing our self-discharge work, we realized that we had very, very uh, long, narrow pores here. And so we needed to consider what charge redistribution was going to do in our self-discharge profile so that we could remove it. So let me explain a little bit about charge redistribution, and then you're going to see how it actually made our project more complicated rather than less complicated as we had hoped. So what I have here is a cartoon of a pore. And so we would have electrolyte in the pore. These are the, the walls of our carbon material. When you charge up a supercapacitor, in fact, any porous electrode, the potential that you measure is measured at the tip of this pore. And so if you want to uh, charge a porous electrode up to, say, a voltage of 1 volt, uh, 
then the tip of this uh, pore will be at one volt, but deeper in the pore, the voltage lags behind. So that potential is going to be much lower, uh, and it'll depend on the shape and length uh, of your pore. And so this is because of the electrolyte resistance in the pore. Ions require a certain amount of time to move down into that, deeper into the pore. So you charge the tip first, and the base of the pore charges much uh, slower. So what happens is if we have more charge at the tip of the pore, we open the circuit, then that charge will equalize throughout the depth or the length of the pore, and what will happen is you would expect a drop in potential. And that drop in potential is because you're measuring the potential at the tip of the pore, but the charge has now moved down into the pore. And so it's perceived as a self-discharge, even though it's not a reaction causing this process. We haven't lost any charge. So when we identified this, what we said was, okay, well, likely this charge redistribution is very rapid. Other people in the literature had said charge redistribution takes about 100 seconds. And then what we expected was, if this is charge redistribution, we can deal with everything after this to talk about the Faradaic self-discharge. So what we wanted to do was actually model to make sure this is true. And the way we did that is we built the transmission line model uh, based on DeLevy's uh, seminal paper from 1963 where he's talking about how the pore acts as a transmission line. And again, that means that you're charging the tip of the pore uh, more quickly than the base. And so we built this simple transmission line. The resistors that you see here model your solution resistance. The capacitors model your pore wall. The, the uh, tip of the pore is up here and the base of the pore is down here. And so we then looked at this model as if it was a, a pore. We can charge the, the tip of the pore, so uh, capacitor uh, one up here. This is a reference electrode one. So we're measuring the potential between our working electrode and reference electrode one. And we're controlling that and we're charging it and we, the rest of the pore acts exactly the way we would expect a pore to react. The capacitor is lower down, deeper into our model pore, charge much more slowly. Then, if we immediately open the circuit, which we can do in B, we would see that potential equalize. Again, exactly what we would expect in a pore, and that potential drops. And the potential of the capacitor deep in the circuit, or the, the potential at the bottom of the pore, climbs until they reach an equilibrium. So our model is working appropriately. We also tested to make sure, uh, of course, that if we held the potential at a, a certain value, so we've charged it up, and then we hold the potential that all the, uh, the capacitors would reach that final potential, and of course they do. So nothing surprising here. What was surprising and what uh, caused uh, more difficulties, as I said, than uh, we had hoped to actually solve some difficulties, was when we plotted these profiles as a function of log time. And what we see is a plateau and then a linear drop in potential. And that was exactly the uh, profile that we were using to say something is an activation control process. Because up until this point, it was believed that if you had a profile that looked like this, it said that you had activation controlled mechanism. And so what this now told us is that this isn't a diagnostic for activation control mechanism for porous electrodes. For porous electrodes, it can also be, be charge redistribution. And so what we then needed to do was go back to our carbon and say, is there any other way that we could say whether it's charge redistribution or that activation controlled process? And the way we um, could do that is by recognizing that if you're looking at the activation controlled self-discharge, the equation is shown right here, the slope that we see here has no dependence on initial potential. And so this is, uh, for those of you who know electrochemistry, this uh, equation is based on the Butler-Vollmer equation, and, and we would expect that if it's a Faraday or an activation controlled process at a particular voltage, it should have a particular rate. And so what we would expect is that if we looked at a particular voltage, let's pick this guy right here, we would have the same slope independent of uh, what our potential started at. And what we saw with carbon is that in fact that slope is very different. That slope depends on our initial potential. We see that with charge redistribution. We see that with an initial potential change, our slope changes. And so what this is suggesting to us is that in this carbon that we're using, one of the main 
reasons it appears to lose charge is charge redistribution. And then we did a number of other experiments. One of the ones that we did was just to add simply a hold time to the experiment. This is uh, the data from our model poor. As we add a hold time, as we expect, the charge redistribution disappears. When we do the same thing for the carbon electrode, we add a hold time, and again, our self-discharge, or the apparent self-discharge is decreasing. And again, that suggests that there is a, a charge redistribution process occurring. Those of you who are, are quick are going to notice that we have very, very long times here. So we're holding these potentials for 75 hours. We would expect those types of times, those lengths of times, would also be influencing Faradaic reactions. And so again, this didn't allow us to completely separate these processes out because we would be reacting away whatever might be causing the Faradaic reaction. So we wanted to make our model a little bit more realistic. And the way we did that is by now putting an activation controlled reaction on the charge redistribution as well. So now we have that same pour. We are going to charge the pour and we know that there's going to be a higher potential at the tip. And so the Faradaic reaction, whatever Faradaic reaction is occurring, is going to preferentially occur at those higher potentials at the tip of the pour. And so we went back to our transmission line model. Oh, I'll get that to that in a second. So as we have our Faradaic reaction happening at the tip of the pore, the, it's going to start discharging the tip and then will cause the charge to move back up the pore. So now we have charge redistribution going back up the pore. And so what we did was we went back to our transmission line model and we're going to allow this to act as a pore with charge redistribution and we're going to apply an activation controlled discharge or activation controlled type discharge at the tip of the, the pore and see what our profile will now look like. So we wanted to make sure our instrument could actually model an activation control process. So my student set up an 85 step experiment where the purple line is the uh, activation controlled reaction that we might want to model and the blue line is what our instrument will actually apply and so the instrument can simulate an activation controlled reaction at the tip of that pore and so uh, we did first of all we tried it with just one capacitor in the system and we get exactly the profile we expect uh, I've the plateau was a little above one here so you can't see it very easily but we have a drop, a linear drop in potential, and the slope that we calculate from this exactly matches what we expect. So everything's working properly here. Now what we're going to do is, again, look at the charge redistribution. This is the profile that we saw previously where we have charge redistribution in the pore. Now let's m mix them together. And what our uh, uh, self-discharge profile now looks like is it has multiple slopes. So we have three regions that we've identified. One, where we have this region where our self-discharge profile is matching the activation control. And that's where the charge redistribution has not yet started. So the charge hasn't yet started moving deeper into this pore. So the activation control process is dominating the electrochemistry at this point. Then the charge starts moving down into the pore, and we see that as a change in slope. And uh, I'm sorry, the charge is moving up into the pore here. And so we see this as a change in slope. The potential is staying higher longer than we expect. And hopefully that makes sense because that charge is now moving back up and charging that top capacitor. And then eventually the charge redistribution ends, which we see on the blue guy, corresponds to this time. And again, we have activation control only and those slopes uh, match. So this is what we expect from our model. So then we go back to our carbon and we look for very, very long self-discharge times to see if we see something similar. And it turned out that we did. We see a plateau, which we expect for both models. We then see sort of a linear region here. And then we see consistently a change in slope where the uh, slope is increased. And this is suggesting to us the charge redistribution is occurring and activation controlled uh, self-discharge is occurring throughout this whole region and then the charge redistribution stops or becomes uh, uh, minimal. Activation control takes over and we see this decrease. The key thing here is that this takes 10,000 seconds 
for this carbon. And up to this point, everybody believed the charge redistribution would end within about 100 seconds. 100 seconds was sort of the longest time anybody expected this to happen. And so what we're now seeing is that charge redistribution is a significant effect, and it takes long uh, periods of time before it stops. And so for our charge redistribution work, what we concluded was, first of all, that that linear drop in potential as a function of log time wasn't a diagnostic for activation control for porous electrodes. Let me highlight, it still applies for planar electrodes or low surface area electrodes that, uh, that diagnostic still applies. But if you have a porous electrode, which we almost always do for supercapacitors, that model no longer applies. Uh, the self-discharge takes much, much longer than uh, we had previously predicted. We can model the activation control uh, self-discharge on uh, with charge redistribution. And in fact, we went further with our model. We then allowed charge redistribution down the pore, charge redistribution up the pore, and activation control. So all three of those process processes. And then the self-discharge profile gets very, very complicated. We have a plateau. We have multiple slopes. And it becomes much more difficult to work with. The biggest uh, conclusion to be drawn here is that charge redistribution cannot be ignored. And this is something that we all did. We all ignored charge redistribution because we thought it was super fast and we could just, you know, just pretend it didn't exist. But what we showed is that it's really important that it, it is considered and it has to be considered with all cases where we have porous electrodes. And so this was sort of one half of the research that we were working on. Simultaneously, we're also trying to figure out what is the Faradaic reaction? Because I just showed that we believe there is a charge redistribution, but also a Faradaic reaction happening at the same time. And again, what we want to do is figure out what is that uh, Faradaic reaction, and then how do we stop it? Because if we can stop it, we can make these supercapacitors last uh, longer. So uh, what we then worked on, or what we were working on simultaneously, is trying to figure out what are the possible mechanisms. So uh, another student and I sat down and we came up with five possible self-discharge mechanisms, five possible chemical reactions that could be happening in the cell discharging the electrode. And so the five that we came up with here are, are shown here. So iron, impurities, this one we didn't actually come up with, industry came up with this one. Um, electrolyte decomposition, carbon corrosion, oxygen reduction, and the reaction of some surface functionalities. I'm going to talk a little bit about iron, I'm going to talk a little bit about oxygen reduction, and then I'm going to just give you a little bit of information about carbon corrosion and surface functionalities, which is what we're working on currently. So let's first talk about the iron. Now when I first started this work, when we talked to the people in the industry, they said, self-discharge, we know what's going on there. It's iron, iron is discharging the cell, end of story. But when you went into the literature to look to see for support for that, there was nothing. Nobody had done any systematic studies where they actually showed that iron was causing this self-discharge. So my student and I thought this would be a really super easy project. We'll just prove that it exists and we'll publish a quick paper. And so what they think uh, we thought was happening and what industry thought was happening is that in the sulfuric acid, we would have a little bit of an iron contamination. And I just picked iron three here, but there's probably likely both. Um, and then that iron would move over to the negative electrode, and it would essentially take an electron off of that negative electrode. It would be uh, reduced to iron two, would then move over to the positive electrode, give up an electron, discharging both of the electrodes, and would shuttle back and forth. And so the way we decided to do this experiment was really very, very simple. We just took our system, we made sure it was super clean, there's no iron in these systems at all, and then we contaminated it with iron. So we started with a very, very pure sulfuric acid. We also took our carbon cloth, which likely has some iron contamination. We cycled it for 350 cycles in sulfuric acid. Then we took that out, washed it, and put it in new electrolytes. And we have shown that you, in that process, we get rid of all the iron. So the self-discharge profile in that situation where there's no iron is shown in black. And then we just contaminated the cell with known amounts of iron. And we see that, in fact, up until 10 to the minus 5 molar, there's no increase in self-discharge. So we need to get to a 10 to the minus 4 molar uh, 
concentration of iron before we start to see an increase in self-discharge. 10 to the minus 4 molar, 10 to the minus 3 molar, that's about where we would have the iron contamination in an industrial sulfuric acid. So that's coming from the drums and then from the, uh, the instruments the supercapacitors are, are made with, or the machines. And so what we're seeing is that, yes, iron will cause some self-discharge, um, but at concentrations higher than we might have previously predicted. If we continue to contaminate, because we like to push things, we see that uh, 10 to the minus 3, we absolutely start seeing self-discharge. 10 to the minus 2 and 10 to the minus 1 molar, you're essentially discharging your electrode completely uh, with these, these iron systems. Now, this is all the positive electrode, and I'm going to talk about the negative electrode as well. But before we move on, we want to, again, use those models to try and figure out, can they sort of give us guidance on, on whether this is a reasonable model? And so here we plug this function as a function of log time. We see that linear uh, drop. It's not surprising. We actually expect this for charge redistribution. Nothing here was surprising until we get to the 10 to the minus 3, where it starts to deviate away. And as we go uh, higher concentrations, we start to see a linear uh, profile when we plot as a function of square root of time, indicating that it is a diffusion control process. And so, yes, iron diffusion here is going to be the cause of self-discharge. And uh, anybody who's interested, we can talk about why this profile, this square root of time profile, which is derived from planar electrodes, actually applies for porous electrodes. It was very interesting that we, that we saw this as well. So that's with the positive electrode. Let me just highlight one other thing. With the positive electrode, oops, as we look at this profile, 10 to the minus uh, 3 or 4 molar, we still see a big drop in, self in uh, our voltage, even when there's no iron. So iron can be a problem, but a lot of the, the profile, a lot of the self-discharge that we're seeing is not actually due to iron. It's due to something else. So if we go to the negative electrode, what we see is a linear profile when we plot a square root of time. This is telling us diffusion control process. But in fact, until we go to very, very high concentrations for the iron, it's not iron. So whatever's happening in this system, iron can uh, discharge the positive electrode, but does not discharge the negative electrode. Something else is happening here. And so we did a, a bunch of work looking at electrolyte uh, decomposition. We showed that it's not the electrolyte decomposing. And then we happened upon oxygen reduction uh, as the actual mechanism that's causing this self-discharge. And again, the way we, we do this is we just change the oxygen concentration in the cell. So we t do three types of experiments. One, where we bubble the electrolyte with nitrogen, which would remove most of the oxygen in the electrolyte. One, where we just don't bubble, so we allow sort of natural amounts of oxygen in the electrolyte, and one where we actively bubble oxygen into the electrolyte. And what we would expect is if we increase the amount of oxygen, if oxygen reduction is the cause of self-discharge, we see a greater amount of self-discharge. And for the negative electrode, what that would show is a, a larger drop in potential, so the curves should move upwards here. And in fact, that's exactly what we see. And when we plot in our uh, different ways, we see that we have a relatively linear plot when we bubble with nitrogen. It's relatively linear when we don't bubble, uh, when we plot it versus square root of time. Absolutely consistent with diffusion of oxygen being the key component here. As we increase the oxygen <coughs> concentration, it moves away from a diffusion control process. So um, we are identifying oxygen as the main cause of self-discharge for the negative electrode which of course is going to be a problem in commercial systems because removing all of the oxygen is, is difficult. And in fact, for porous electrodes, it's particularly difficult. We believe that this uh, self-discharge that we still see even when we bubble the electrolyte with nitrogen is oxygen reduction of the oxygen that's deep in the pores that we are having trouble removing. So for a commercial system, you're going to still see this self-discharge and we have not yet found a way around that. <coughs> 
And the last thing I'm going to be talking to you about are, are carbon surface functionalities. And so this turned out to be what we believe uh, to be the, the reaction that's discharging the positive electrode, but it's also a very, very difficult project to work with. And that's because on any particular carbon surface, there are lots of surface functionalities. And we focus on oxygen surface functionalities, but there are lots of different si surface functionalities. They could be nitrogen um, and, and other ones. And so uh, on a particular carbon surface, there are going to be all these different groups. We separate them into acidic and basic groups. And each of these surface functionalities may be electrochemically active. If it's electrochemically active, it may help us by storing charge, or it may hurt us by causing self-discharge, or it may do both. And so the key here is that not only do we have to identify which of these surface functionalities are on the carbon, which ones are electrochemically active, and then what, uh, what effect do they have. Now one of the surface functionalities that's particularly important that I'm going to draw your attention to is right here. This, as it's drawn, is actually a quinone. This quinone is believed to be a pseudocapacitive charge storage. So we like this surface functionality. If possible, one would want to increase this type of surface, surface functionality, assuming, of course, that it doesn't cause self-discharge. So uh, the way we work on this is, again, we're looking for electrochemical signatures because while there are lots of surface functionalities, some of them aren't, don't do any electrochemistry. And so that's okay. We can leave them, we can ignore them, they're not a problem. They're only of interest to us if they do electrochemistry. So again, that quinone group that I just talked about is the, the quinone hydroquinone, that's that reversible couple. And this is the one that is believed to exist right here, be reacting right here at a 0 0.5 volts versus SHE. And again, this is the one that we can develop through cycling, one of the reasons that we picked this particular carbon. So we know this quinone peak develops. We know that we want it to develop, but how does it develop? Where does it come from? It's either on the surface but not active, or we are actually making this carbon surface functionality in our treatment of the carbon. And so we wanted to find out where it comes from because again, it's, it's the surface functionality we'd like to increase on the surface. And we know, of course, and I'm sure you've noticed, that as we do this CV, we have this very flat region, but we have a very large oxidation wave at these positive potentials, which disappears with cycling. And so one of the questions that uh, we asked ourselves is, is this oxidation wave here related to those quinone peaks? Do we have a reaction on the surface? Are we taking the carbon itself and doing some sort of oxidation which is forming these quinones, or is it the, we have a surface functionality that's redox active, which we're then converting to quinone groups, or are these two completely separate? Now, why do we care so much about this guy other than the quinone groups? As we cycle, we actually notice that the self-discharge profile changes. So with these guys, if we do a first self-discharge profile shown in blue, then we cycle once, and then we do another self-discharge profile shown in burgundy. And there's a much less self-discharge. And again, we want to reduce the self-discharge. So is that oxidation wave associated with that self-discharge? For comparison, this is the self-discharge profile of 10 self-discharge for an electrode that's been cycled to steady state. So that's where that oxidation wave has completely disappeared and those quinone peaks are developed. So we expect this self-discharge uh, to be quite consistent. And again, what this suggested to us is that possibly this reaction right here is causing self-discharge. And so we put a lot of effort into trying to identify what that reaction is. And I had a student who spent many, many months, in fact two years, looking at different spectroscopic techniques. Can we figure out what this surface functionality is spectroscopically? Can we do some electrochemistry, change the surface functionalities, and see that spectroscopically. And it turned out that there was nothing that we could do that would actually give us anything because we might be able to see lots of surface functionalities, but we didn't know whether they were electrochemically active. So that brought us right back to the electrochemistry and trying to figure it out in an, in an electrochemical way. So one of the things we did is we decided that if this CV, 
if this oxidation wave is associated with the quinone peaks, then if we cycled only to about 0 0.6, then if uh, we need to do that oxidation, then the quinones wouldn't develop. And so we did the experiment. We cycled between 0 and 0 0.6 for about 400 cycles. And in fact, we don't see any quinone peak development, which tells us that at least part of that oxidation wave is the development of the quinone. If we then cycle to one volt, as this is the same electrode now cycled to one volt, we see those quinone peaks develop. So part of that wave is the, uh, the development of the quinone. We also wanted to decide, does the self-discharge relate only to this oxidation wave? Does it, does it need to have any quinone? And we see that here. Again, we're looking at the CV, but only from above 0.7 up to 1. Um, the other key here is with the other uh, CVs, we were going down to 0 volts. One of the things we're always concerned about is we know that there's oxygen reduction in the cell. Oxygen can be reduced to hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide might actually react with our carbon surface. So could we be forming these quinones by having the uh, peroxide doing some reactions, uh, chemical reactions on the surface? So we decided to stay above 0.7 volts, that way we're not doing any oxygen reduction. And we see exactly the same thing we saw before. So we're not actually forming peroxide, or if we're forming peroxide, it's not the thing that's uh, help, uh, causing these changes. And then we uh, went to, as I said, a bunch of spectroscopic techniques. We also went to the bone titration, which is a titration that allows us to quantify the acidic and basic groups on the surface, those surface functionalities. And I sort of gr grouped them all here. We did a bunch of bone titrations where you can separate out the lactones from the carboxyl groups and so on. And so what we would expect is that if we have surface functionality developing, we would expect a large increase in that surface functionality immediately, and then it should slow down over time as we cycle. And we were very hopeful for the bone titration. This is sort of the, the standard for, for chemists. If we want to look at surface functionalities, the bone titration is the way to go. And so we did this, and uh, what we saw, originally we were very excited, we saw the basic groups appeared to be decreasing, and then all of a sudden they increased at the end. This is exactly opposite to what we might expect, and in fact, there's really no trend here. The acidic groups uh, did a very similar thing. We thought they were increasing, then they dropped, then they increased, then they increased again. And so with this bone titration, what we determined is that because it's an ex situ method, we couldn't get anything really out of it. It wasn't telling us anything about the electrochemical surface functionalities. So at this point, uh, we really don't know what <laughs> is going on with these guys. And so for this work, it, it's still continuing, but we're really trying to figure out how do we identify those surface functionalities? How do we split apart that development of the quinone, which is in that oxidation wave, but we also believe that some of that oxidation wave is actually the carbon converting to carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. And so currently we're trying to separate those processes out. So uh, the surface functionality we think might be active, but we really have, uh, this is sort of gut reaction based on sort of a bunch of experiments that are giving a, us a little hint, is that we may have a pyrone or a ketone which is active, but we haven't fully identified it. The key is, of course, that we need to cycle above 0.7 to develop those quinones. So if the quinones are important, increasing your energy storage, you need to go to those higher potentials. And overall, these are the conclusions from everything I've sort of talked about today. We've identified that charge redistribution and, self and the Faradayk reaction are intricately linked, and it's really hard to separate them out. There are some tricks we can do in terms of looking at the slopes of self-discharge profiles. But in general, if you have a porous electrode, you absolutely have to consider charge redistribution as well. We've identified that iron shuttles are important at high concentrations. L not really going to be super important in industry. They do play a small role, but there's something else that plays a bigger role. Oxygen reduction is absolutely important on the negative electrode. The surface functionalities, we believe, are the things that are, are causing problems in, in the industrial uh, type setting. Um, and we need to develop better models. And this is one of the things that we are currently trying to work on, is how do we develop better models to separate these processes?
So as a last thing, let me just acknowledge all the people who've done the work. Jennifer Black is my student who worked on uh, the charge redistribution. So uh, her PhD was all about identifying that charge redistribution. Sarah Gertzen is the student who did all the ex situ methods for identifying the surface functionalities, all the different uh, spectroscopic techniques. Alicia Oracle is the one who's working on all of the Faradaic reactions. So she has worked all the way from iron all the way to the surface functionalities she's writing up at the moment. And then a number of these undergrads worked on all of these different projects. So uh, let me finish by thanking you for your attention and I welcome questions. Are, are there living systems, any super capacitors to your knowledge that might go beyond project <coughs> that uh, have solved these discharge problems you're concerned about and you could maybe emulate what nature is? That's a very good question, one I hadn't thought about. Um, off the top of my head, I haven't seen anything like that. Um, but one of the things that we find interesting, one of, the, one of my students is working on a biosensor type material that is, is sourced from actually humans and is also a supercapacitor material. Now I've never seen anything where it acts like a supercapacitor in, in the body, but that could just be because I haven't looked through that literature. But it's an interesting idea. I'm going to go look into that. Is there a way that you can cheat the system? That you can cheat it? No. Uh, you, can, you can somehow, you know, doing the electrochemical uh, reactions, uh, make it make it feel, make it think, you know, that, that there is no surface to to spread out in this charge. It's a good question and something I, I've always yeah I've always wanted to do that. I have some ideas. Um, I'm not going to share them because if if they work. I will be a millionaire. Well, I don't know if I will be, but um, one of the things we do see is actually we can cheat it in the wrong way. Um, with the iron reaction, as I said, it fits that model for a planar surface, but it's a highly porous surface. And what we're seeing is that we can actually deplete the uh, impurity inside the pore. And so we have diffusion only to the surface, and then it appears as a planar surface. But there's just, I haven't figured out a way um, a very easy way to be able to cheat it in the right way. So I can cheat it and make it worse, but I can't cheat it and make it better. <laughs> but if you come up with something, we should definitely talk. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. okay, thanks. Uh, I have one question, but I missed some of your slides. I'm not sure if I can. Uh, that's why. The, your carbon model is carbon class, right? Yes. And it's done through any uh, pre-treatment? So the only treatment we use is we put it in the electrolyte uh -huh. and we cycle it for 350 cycles. And we, the effect of that is, is to develop the quinone groups, but it uh -huh. also gets rid of any Im metal impurities uh -huh. that are yeah. in that iron because, or, or in that carbon, because all carbons have some iron and, uh -huh. and uh, metal impurities, so that leaches those out. Okay. Because I remember some of the, uh, uh, this uh, class they sometimes they have some polymer coating, you're sure you don't have any? Yeah, we don't have any polymer coating. We actually had some material we were very excited about, it, which had a, a polymer coating on it, uh -huh. and it was a terrible material. We were uh, never able to get that polymer off. So this is a very nice, pure and clean carbon. Oh, clean carbon. And you focus on the, uh, the quino, so you don't have the Cabos X group? We probably have a lot of groups on the surface. Uh -huh. I, from other work I did in my PhD, I'm, I'm certain there are pyrones on the uh, yeah, surface, I but I believe there are a lot of surface functionalities. Our bone titrations are showing a lot of surface functionalities, yeah. but I think most of them aren't electrochemically active. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we struggle with is that with this carbon cloth, the surface functionalities in this part of the carbon cloth are actually completely different than the other ah, one. Yeah. But the electrochemistry is the same. So all those ex situ methods mm -hmm. really don't work for us. Mm -hmm. The electrochemistry is the only thing that's the same. But the titration cannot tell you uh, which, which your functionality is right. Yeah, it can tell you which ones are there, but it yeah. can't tell you which ones are active. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so what we had hoped to see was an increase in one surface functionality, and we could therefore say we see an increase in the electrochemistry, and therefore this must be the same surface functionality. Mm -hmm. But that variability across this surface has, has totally uh, made that impossible. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Essentially. And that was, you know, um, I always sort of mention this because it was a lot of work that was uh, something like 10 students doing literally thousands of titrations on this carbon oh, yeah. in order to figure that out. So. Yeah, I think your work needed to be very patient. Exactly. Patient <laughs> is also really impressive. Okay, let's thank the uh, oh. speaker again. <laughs>